My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am pleased to welcome you here on this cold, cold night for a magical mystery tour. Our guides this evening will be the world-class tenor and interpreter of leader, Ian Bostridge, who is here to present his new book, Schubert's Winter Journey, Anatomy of an Obsession. A recent review in the Wall Street Journal called Schubert's Winter Journey, an unusual and compelling book, it captures the enduring mystery of this seminal work in the leader tradition. We, readers who love Winter Isa will find the book a rare treat, and those who do not yet know the piece have here a fine companion as they listen. Mr. Bostridge will be accompanied by pianist, conductor, vocal coach, and tonight interviewer, Tim Ribchester. Please welcome Ian Bostridge and Tim Ribchester. <laughs> Thank you. 
I thought I would start by reading um, the first part of the chapter from this book about dear Lindenbaum, the linden tree. And the chapter starts with some, with three little quotations. First of all, Bismarck in 1892, the unification of Germany would not have been possible without German art, without German science, and without German music, the German Lied, in particular, the German song. Bismarck again in 1893, let no one underestimate the power of German song as an ally in wartime. And on a rather different tack, here is Sigmund Freud in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in 1920. If we are to take it as a truth that knows no exception that everything living dies for internal reasons, becomes inorganic once again, then we shall be compelled to say that the aim of all life is death. The urgent pulse of the previous song in the cycle, Erstarung, turns into the rustling of Schubert's most famous song, Der Lindenbaum, a transfiguration of the driven triplet figure the pianist can reflect in performance by allowing one song to melt seamlessly into the other. In another act of motivic binding, the simple tune, which is dislocated by the triplets at the beginning of Der Lindenbaum, is a major key version of the driven of a melody which propels Erstarung. The openings of each song are closely related. The present tense melts into the past. I seek in vain becomes I dreamed so many sweet dreams. C minor becomes E major, the first time in the cycle that a song starts in the major key. The fact that it is a semitone above, above the relative major, which would have been E flat, lifts the song, taking us to another place, another time, a translation best affected not by pausing between the songs in performance, but by juxtaposing them as intimately as possible. Key relations between songs in Winterreiser often have a powerful dramatic or emotional effect, one which can be lost when the original sequence is disrupted by transposition to, say, baritone or bass keys. That gentle rustling of the leaves of last summer rather than the winter branches of the present, specified, specified later in the poem, is then itself gently interrupted by horn calls, the romantic sound par excellence, the call of the past, of memory, sensuality at a distance, distance, absence, and regret, as Charles Rosen puts it in his book, The Romantic Generation. Remember those horns, for they will return later in this song, and horns will play a significant role later in the cycle, a, po a post horn at midpoint and a funereal brass ensemble towards the end. The Lindenbaum, the lime or linden tree in English, is a magical, mythical tree, freighted with allegorical significance, something the art historian Michael Baxendall alerts us to in his classic study, The Limewood Sculptors of Renaissance Germany. There are reports of holy lime, lime trees hung with votive tablets against the plague, of many lime groves visited as places of pilgrimage, of lime seeds eaten by the women of Upper Bavaria, of the leaves, blossom, and bark of the tree applied to the body as a means to strength and beauty. The lime did have, broadly speaking, festal associations. As, Hieron as Hieronymus Bock said in his Herbarium, the Kreuterbuch in 1546, it was a tree to dance under. As far back as Homer, the linden had been a magical tree. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, the transformation of the old couple Baucis and Philemon into a lime tree and an oak, respectively, made it a symbol of female conjugal fidelity. The lindenbaum is deeply embedded in European and more specifically in German culture. Walter von der Vogelweide, one of the greatest German poets of the high Middle Ages, wrote a song sometime in the late 12th or early 13th century which crystallizes the wider association between love and the linden. Under the linden tree, on the open field where we two had our bed, 
you still can see lovely both broken flowers and grass on the edge of the woods in a vale Tandara day sweetly sang the nightingale Walter's is a courtly song about love and a relationship between a low-born girl and a man of substance Winterizer's tale told topsy-turvy we have met Goethe's Werther already a very famous book in German literary culture and seen him crying his eyes out with his beloved but unattainable Charlotte Linden trees figure in his story at iconic moments here he is having just parted from Charlotte and her fiance Albert he's made friends with them both perhaps forever the pain of seeing her with Albert has been too much I stood gazing after them in the moonlight I threw myself upon the ground and wept I then sprang up and ran out upon the terrace and saw under the shade of the linden trees her white dress disappearing near the garden gate I stretched out my arms and she vanished when Werther has shot himself in the head dispirited in impossible love it takes him 12 hours to die I was one of the children in Massenet's opera Werther in 1997 sorry 1977 at the English National Opera and remember laughing with the cruelty of childhood at the meal the operatic hero may, manages to make of his end singing clarion voiced to the last he tells Charlotte where he wishes to be buried at the corner of the churchyard looking toward the fields there are two lime trees if the associations between the Linden and romantic love are of striking and obvious relevance to Schubert's song the political resonances too should not be forgotten given all that can be said about Winterreiser's role as a secret coded lament for the reactionary climate at large in Germany and Austria in the 1820s Linden trees live to an enormous age the oldest in Germany today is said to be in the marketplace of the village of Schenk Lenksfeld in eastern Hessen reputedly planted in the 9th century trees like this were planted in many settlements in German speaking lands in a custom dating back to pre-Christian times sacred to Freya and known as the Tanzlinde the dance linden they were often rededicated to the Virgin Mary or the Apostles village meeting places these Dorf Linden village Lindens were a symbol of community and indeed of Germanness an aura only intensified by the holding of assemblies and judicial courts under their branches the terms thing Linde and Gerichtslinde refer respectively to the immemorial institution of German folk government the thing or ding and to the execution of community justice Gericht held in the shadow of the tree in the political winter time of the 1820s under the domination of Metternich's reactionary government the dreams the dreamer dreams in this song might well be of an idealized past in which Germans of all sorts governed themselves under the linden tree free from foreign interference or bureaucratic oppression alike it's surely that folkloric national symbolism that has helped to make dear Lindenbaum into the most popular of Schubert songs not popular in the way his Andy Musik and Die Forella are the songs of the concert hall or once upon a time the drawing room though Lindenbaum used to be taken out of context in recital more than any other song from the Schubert cycles but as an outdoorsy jovial community singing or boy scouting sort of a song the main tune itself is folk-like in its simplicity firmly rooted in one major key constructed from simple triads and scales Müller's poem Wilhelm Müller the poet of Winterreiser is at one with this what the great German poet Heinrich Heine wrote in a letter of 1826 to Müller how pure how transparent are your songs they're just like folk songs is especially true of Der Lindenbaum a real Kunstlied im Volk Volkston an art song in the popular style I remember going to Berlin around 2005 and telling my taxi driver that I was to be singing Schubert's Winterreiser the following night at the Philharmonie home of the Berlin Philharmonic ah or rather ach he said and started to sing a little im Volkston it sounded very much like Der Lindenbaum and in essence it was 
the very mention of Winterreiser had, after all, elicited the taxicab rendition. But it wasn't Schubert still in Dumbam, not really, and a single variant note rising at the end of the first sung phrase, rather than falling, identified it as the folk song fashioned from Schubert's original by the composer Friedrich Zilcher, 1789-1860. In order to work his questionable magic, launching Der Lindenbaum transformed into the anonymous stream of folk music. Not all singers of the song have known, like my taxi driver, what they are singing, its history or its pedigree. Silcher had to eviscerate what Schubert had made. The minor key that characterizes the wanderer's journey in the darkness, the middle section, eyes closed, cannot be allowed. Nor can the turbulent musical ep episode which evokes the wind blowing in his face and his hat being blown from his head, something that happened to me yesterday in Philadelphia. <laughs> it all has to be much simpler. In Zilcher's solo version for voice and piano or guitar, it's a strophic song with a basic chordal accompaniment, the same tune for each verse. That fabulous rustling in the piano has to go. The melodic line was altered in the direction of greater psychological uplift. You can hear the great leader, Mozart and operetta tenor, Richard Tauber, sing Zilcher's version, Lieder Hosen and All, in a 1930 movie, Das Lockend at Seal, The End of the Rainbow. It's on YouTube. Am Brunnen vor dem Tore, as it became known in true folk style, went on to become one of the most anthologized of German folk songs, to be sung a cappella with unison voices or a mixed choir, or perhaps accompanied by guitar around a campfire. A songbook for secondary school and years seven and eight in primary school included an adaptation of Zilch's version. The book was compulsory teaching material for the Volksschulen of the Zurich Canton in 1931. More often than not, However, the song would have been orally transmitted with little variations in the melody according to the mood of the singer and radical departures, no doubt, from Miller's folkish, popular or folky, but still artful text. Here's the beginning of a version recorded in Silesia in the early 1900s. By the well in front of the gate, there stands my beloved's house. She swore to be true to me. I went in and out with her. The oddest thing about this version is that, it contain, that it is that it contains never a mention of the fabled linden tree. <coughs> this sort of shared musical culture had large, largely disappeared by the end of the 20th century to be replaced by the commodified commonality of rock and pop music. Even in this sort of popular culture, however, Der Lindenbaum and its derivatives could make a mark. The Greek chanteurs Nana Muscuri, a Eurovision fixture from the 1960s to the 1980s, had an unlikely version derived from Zilcher's, which can be seen on YouTube. Ancient Greek ruins, white quasi-priestly gown, bird song, catchy beat, and of course, like Schubert himself, a musician with trademark glasses, if somewhat larger. <laughs> There's even a German language episode of the hit American satirical cartoon, The Simpsons, in which a version of the song is rapped by Bach, sorry, by Bart, on the school bus outside the local nuclear power station where his father works. At the well in front of the great gate, off there stands such an ape-horny linden tree, oh yeah, I dreamt in its shade so many sweet dreams, so many sweet dreams under this ape-horny linden tree, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Here, dear Lindenbaum replaces a folk song about the all-American mythical hero, the former slave John Henry, who dies pitting his solitary strength against a newfangled steam-driven hammer trying to save his own job and those of his men. Two very different cultures. Thank you. Well, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here tonight, uh, both collaborating with Mr. Bostridge and also um, being able to explore uh, what I can sincerely say is a masterwork here of... Uh, imaginative scholarship and a beautifully presented one at that. Um, I've had a great time reading it over the last uh, few nights and digesting some of it. 
uh, and I can't wait to, uh, to get stuck into some questions here. I mean, by way of beginning and breaking the ice, I think uh, you ended with Bart Simpson's rap there, and uh, I have to ask, how did you come across that particular source? It um, made the, the haystack of sources that, that went into the Well, it's sh sh shameful, because my, you know, I did do some real research, but it was Wikipedia, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was right. I mean, then checked up on the sort of, there's a huge uh, corpus of, uh, uh, you know, Simpsons related material on, or online, a Simpsons archive, so I then went and checked it up. Uh, so this wasn't a chance happening on German television in a hotel room or anything? No, 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 like no, 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 sadly not. I've never actually seen it, but I've, 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 I think I've read some of the script, the rest of the script on, 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 the, on the Simpsons website, yeah. Right. Well, in any case, the um, sources for this book are myriad. It's a, what I would call a, a kaleidoscopic, sorry, a kaleidoscopic array of um, not just sources, but also the, the extent to which you delve into various academic disciplines without, I would ever say, making it in a fully academic work, uh, in a sense. It's, very, it's uh, a work that's friendly to many readers, and we'll get into that. But just all I can fit on one page in my notebook today as I went through trying to identify all the disciplines that are touched on here. We have geohistory, meteorology, psychoanalysis, theoretical physics, sexuality, genetics, sociology, art history, military history, critical theory and economics, biography, and autobiography, in addition to the expected disciplines of languages, music theory, music history, and uh, of course, literary history, too. Um, so this book, I get the sense, has been, it'd been gestating for a while in your, uh, in your mind as an idea. What was the process which came from the, from the big, took you from the beginning of when it first crystallized that you wanted to write about this tremendous work in addition to performing it? Um, and how did you uh, then allow that process to unfold? How much was research? How much was performance and <coughs> reflection? I think it, the thing is, I, I, uh, I, my origins are as an academic historian, and through my all my 20s, that's what I was doing. I mean, first as an undergraduate, a graduate, and then uh, a postgraduate, writing about witchcraft in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, than which nothing could be further apart, you know. Um, uh, and I was finishing that book that came out of my doctoral work um, as I became a singer. So I had this idea that I could carry on doing the two things. I'd been doing them in harness for a while. Uh, what I didn't realize that fin was that finishing a book is a very different thing from starting a book. Uh, and I, was, I was, was commissioned, just as I became a singer, to write a book about singing that was supposed to be based on... Um, uh, there's a wonderful book by Simon Callow called Being an Actor, and the publisher at that point thought it would be great to write Being a Singer about becoming a singer. Um, but I, I actually never made any progress on that at all. Uh, but I did spend the next, uh, I suppose, 10 or even 15 years writing a lot of various stuff, doing uh, a lecture on music and magic for the, for the Edinburgh Festival, writing program notes for, for, for CDs of Britain... Schubert, all sorts of things that I'd done, writing a column for a magazine called Standpoint, and writing long review articles for the Times Literary Supplement. And when another publisher came to me and said, would you like to write a book? I said, well, I, can, I can't write a book at the moment, but I can, we could put a book together with all this stuff and I could write some connective material, some connective tissue to make it into a book. So we did that. That came out in 2011. And then she said, well, what would you like to do now? And I wasn't really sure because I was aware of this problem of writing a, of, of writing a, 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 a book with a, with a big arc, a sort of single large arc. I wasn't sure I had the focus for that. My wife's a writer and I knew from her experience that you need real concentration to do that. But my wife indeed suggested this book because a Finterizer is something I've been thinking about. I first sang it 30 years ago. So I've been thinking about it a lot. And also the structure of writing one essay, as it were, per um, song, so 24 essays, allowed me the sort of journalistic freedom meant I could write in a hotel room. It wouldn't have been a book that would have been possible to write before the advent of the internet because so much material is now available on the internet, so much research material. Um, and what was wonderful in the process of writing the book once I got going was, was this um, opportunity to range very widely. And I suppose in the end what it took, it took me back to intellectually was my training in uh, 
at Cambridge, I did a one-year master's degree in the history of science, and the history of science is full, and that particular side of the history of science, full of notions of bringing together unlikely subjects in order to illuminate them. So I remember particularly, uh, I'd, I'd been taught by a man who wrote a book called Leviathan and the Air Pump, which was about uh, <laughs> Thomas Hobbes's classic political text of the 1650s, Leviathan, and Robert Boyle's experimentation on the air pump and trying to see how those two things were linked together by Hobbes's researches into the vacuum and his disagreement with Hobbes, with his disagreements with, with Boyle on the nature of the, of, of the vacuum. So it's all about bringing different things together. So uh, in the song in Winterreise where leaves are falling from a tree, it's about looking at nascent probability theory and the idea of the norm, the normal, which I think is so relevant to Winterreise because one of the things that's always interested me is, is this guy normal or is he every man? Is he every man normal or is he a weirdo? Is he on the outside? Um, or in, I didn't go on to read the whole of the Lindenbaum chapter, but going on to look at Thomas Mann's use of Dear Lindenbaum in, in The Magic Mountain, where it's seen, he, Mann sees it as a symbol both of, of death and of political conservatism. So all these sort of different, different subjects come, yeah. come out in the book. Well, and given the breadth of the trajectory that you take, it's almost like you use the song cycle as a lens from which to gaze outward into the world at large, rather than necessarily looking at Schubert through any one particular lens. Um, then was this something that you had planned in mind from the very beginning, that it would cover this breadth of philosophical scope, or was that something that took on a life of its own as your process unfolded? I think it took on a life of its own, and I, as I went along, I, got, I sometimes got a bit worried because I thought, well, I'm just, I'm just being irresponsibly digressive. <laughs> um, but I, I did get a sense as I reached the end of the book that it did all sort of somehow mysteriously, and I'm not sure I can put my finger on it, it did, it did all tie together. Um, and it's not always the case, I mean, it's not the case that it would necessarily influence... Um, a performance of Venturizer or influence an audience in the way they listen to it. It would inform it perhaps more. And I think the other idea is to, is to bring the piece to people who are unfamiliar with the whole genre, who, who see it as a maybe as an intimidating, gloomy masterwork of great length. Um, and by actually seeing how it's embedded in history, I wanted to bring it to people who might find that to be a way in. Well, you make a reference to a phrase that really stuck in my mind is the questioning splendor of art at one point. Um, and could you maybe unpack that notion for us a little bit? Uh, what you mean exactly by that? Is that to do with the circularity of when an artist performs and then is provoked to reflect upon what they've performed and then what is then encountered in the process of reflection and further research feeds back into the next performance? Yes, and I mean, there's, there are all sorts of, of currents of exchange going on because, I mean, there are, it's, a, it's triangulation, really, because you've, you've got the work mm -hmm. and you've got the performer and you've got the audience and you're all giving each other new things. And I think it's important, one of the things that is very unrecognized in, in classical performance is the contribution of the audience to the meaning of the event. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, th that's, I think that's part of what I meant, yeah. And perhaps the idea that it's important for, an, in order to make an artwork an artwork, is it important for the audience to be able to talk about it, to have a language in which to express their reactions to one another and build some kind of shared experience. Yes, um, but I think with music yeah. it's difficult because music seems to point beyond itself to such a huge extent. It seems to be about all sorts of things that we find it difficult to talk about. Uh, and it is its own language, non-verbal language, and so we talk around it, really. And that's again, is what this book really does. It talks around uh, Winterreiser in order to deepen our experience of it, but it's not really trying to replace Winterreiser, because Winterreiser speaks to us about things. I, you know, I could, I'm not sure I mentioned this, and it's verging on the very pretentious, but when Winterreiser says at the end of his tractate, as you know, what we can't talk about, we must be silent about. Uh, it's actually we, we, what, that's what art is for, really, mm -hmm. to talk about those things or to, to, to ventilate them. 
Well, and it's refreshing that you're not necessarily looking for concrete answers uh, to interpret questions in the music, whereas at the, at the end, I mean, you end as open-endedly as the song cycle mm -hmm. itself in a way. Um, but uh, that we have this constellation of ideas that just kind of revolve and circulate around each song, and, and each chapter is dedicated to a song, and that we end up um, sometimes being surprised by the connections that form from chapter to chapter, as well as the ones that are um, collide within one given song, uh, as uh, as you've uh, designed it. Um, this work, from a from a musician's perspective, now this is an intimidating piece for both singers and pianists to mm -hmm. take on. Um, uh, toward the beginning of your introduction, you say one of the keys to um, having secure memorization in performance of this work is that you started very young. Yeah. Um, so it's a second nature thing at this point. Um, beyond the concept of memorization, do you have advice for singers and pianists who are thinking about taking on this interpretive challenge? Uh, and maybe intimidated by it either artistically or intellectually? Um, uh, one way to go about it might be starting with doing it in, I mean, it's very practical <laughs> advice, start, just starting by doing it in sections. And one of the interesting things about the piece is it was the first 12 songs were the original piece. Schubert found uh, 12 poems by Wilhelm Müller called Die Winterreise in an almanac and set them straight away to music. And only later on did he discover, did discover that Miller had rather annoyingly set 12 more, I mean, he had created 12 more poems and also broken apart the 12 poem structure that he'd originally created. And Schubert had to make the decision whether to go back and break apart his 12 song structure or actually just pick out the ones he hadn't set and compose them higgledy piggledy. And that's in the end what he did. And I think he did it and made a virtue of it because it then became a, um, something much more modern and fractured and less narr narratively driven. Um, so I'd, I'd say break it up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And at this point, I would love to uh, open to the floor for questions. Um, I'd like to ask anyone who has a question to raise their hand and keep it raised until someone with a microphone reaches you, uh, at which point then uh, please speak into the microphone. Yes, the gentleman over here. Should I stand up? Uh, please. So the way this whole cycle ends with the uh, Liamon, um, do you think it has, or is part of it is Schubert trying to express his aestheticism or his view on aesthetics or um, role of an artist being um, this, um, I guess faith, the, the, a person who's only faithful to art and who's silently performing and contributing to the world of art. Um, so there was an earlier song, I don't remember exactly what the D number was, but I think it was quite early, it's called Der Zenge. Mm -hmm. And in the thing, it, well, it's set to a, uh, a Goethe poem or mm -hmm. like an excerpt of it. And in there, there are two lines or something like, you know, I'm the bird who sits in the branches and the song out of my uh, throat um, is only, basically he's saying I'm you know, living and singing for the art and I don't want any rewards. Um, it seems like a trend that's all over or in a lot of Schubert's art. Do you think he's part of the message is that? Perhaps part of it. I think there's a very particular um, character to the, to the last song of Winterreiser because it's so, we're presented with somebody poverty stricken who's producing music that's so etiolated and thin that it's almost not music at all. And um, nobody's listening to him. So you're right that there is this sense of being self-contained and performing for yourself. But also, interestingly, in the context of the cycle, it's the first time we have contact between two people and it's the first time we have a third party genuinely introduced. We've heard about the, um, the girl, her mother, family. We've heard about a, a charcoal burner who have, whose hut uh, the wanderer takes refuge in. But it's the first time the wanderer actually meets somebody. Um, so I think it, it, it's, a, it's a, very ambiguous, a very ambiguous ending and whether it, it, it's interesting to think of whether it offers something positive or negative. And I think it's, it's fascinating that you see it in a way as offering something positive if slightly austere as a vision of, of, of art. Uh, I think it also represents Schubert's fear of um, his fate, in a way, to be not listened to, mm -hmm. to be indigent, uh, to be outside society, because he was really the, 
the first of the canonical composers in our Western classical tradition to work wholly within the marketplace and to live wholly from the sale of his product, his labor in the marketplace. He, d he didn't have a, a, a wealthy patron. He didn't work for the church. And uh, he was also aware of the fact that he had uh, syphilis and that that would eventually turn nasty. It's not clear that that's what he died of in the end. But um, I think that all those things influence the last song, as well as the, the irony which, uh, which um, I think Müller builds in, which is that it's the liar man, and the liar is absolutely the, the, the romantic instrument par excellence. It's, uh, there are lots of uh, and collections of verse called the liar and the sword or the liar and this and that and the liars were, were all over the place in 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 foot sort of soft in, in furnishings in houses beat of my mm -hmm. furnishings everywhere and, and for this liar not actually to be the liar of the poet which is the foundation of lyric poetry after all but to be this rather grotesque mechanical instrument that has no possibility of human expressivity at all is i think that's a brilliant stroke of, of Wilhelm Müller's did you mention in one of the chapters that there is actually an artist who uh, has mastered the hurdy-gurdy and who recorded the entire cycle, not just Der Leierman, but the yeah. actual, uh, the entire Winterreise on that instrument? He's called Matthias Leubner, mm -hmm. and having been very rude about, as I had just have been, about the possibilities of the hurdy-gurdy, and I'm sure normally it, it was a, uh, a pretty nasty instrument. It's, it, you, you know, you, a metal wheel is being turned against uh, a couple of uh, strings uh, to create a drone, a bit like a bagpipe. And then the, uh, the player presses keys so that a tune can be played against this drone. So there's no possibility really of inflecting it in any vocal way, or, or it would seem so. But actually, this, there is this wonderful recording of the whole piece on a hurdy-gurdy, and it, uh, it's, it's a little bit wearing to listen to for a very long time. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a fascinating exercise and, and shows great artistry on the part of the player, I think. Yes, sir, uh, in the middle there. Uh, yes, yes, please, just the microphone's coming. Um, no, just a, a few rows back. Oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 yes, you'll be. Yes, the gentleman behind, first of all, and then you yourself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the, uh, the effect of performing a piece like this has on someone like yourself or anyone else. I mean, something of the, tra the tragic dimensions of this. How do you feel at the end? of this? Does it affect your, your state of mind? Are you able to just brush this off and walk off and have a drink after this? Or does it take time um, to emerge from the, that particular it, tragic It world? sort of varies. It depends how much I've eat, managed to eat. <laughs> <laughs> one of the I mean, it sounds really stupid, but one of the um, major problems in singing is, deci is deciding and getting right when you eat in the day, because you don't want to eat too close to the um, event itself. But if you don't eat enough, then you find yourself very low in energy by the end. But to move on from that. Um, I, I often find myself unable to do the... It seems weird to try and be sociable afterwards. Um, there are occasions where I've tried to go out to dinner with friends afterwards and I've just been sitting there and unable to speak. Or the whole thing of the, the green room after a concert in somewhere like... In London, the, the Wigmore Hall is the main venue for leader recitals and there's a tradition of people coming back and greeting you afterwards. And it, after a Winterreiser, it's, it's, it's a bit of a bit of a effort to do that. It sounds very pretentious, but I, it just really, no. you just feel it's understandable. Knocked, knocked out, really, by it. And it happened to me the other day as well, singing it in, I did a performance in the Barbican Hall in London, a big concert hall, and because of this book, I'd agreed to do um, a, a Q&A afterwards with the audience. And as soon as I went on stage to do it, I knew that for me, it was a very peculiar thing to have done and I sort of wished I hadn't done it and I think the audience liked it because they like to hear about how it works but it's um I don't know how the, the audience feel wrung out after it as well I think perhaps true yes I share that thank you yes please pass that uh, I was wondering whether you could touch on the use of the appoggiatura mm -hmm. in Schubert's songs I have heard it in the Shona Miller in, but I was wondering whether it was ever applied to the Winterreiser I think there are lots, there are lots of appoggiaturas and they're, they're often written in this old-fashioned way uh, which we have to correct. Uh, yeah, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of that sort of aching uh, melodic uh, uh, 
dislocation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, over here. Uh. Hello, I saw that you're going to perform Winterreise at the Armory in New York, is that right? Um, gosh, I can't, I th uh, I'm performing at the Armory, I don't, uh, maybe I'm performing Winterreise. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling that I was before. I'm, I'm on a tour in April where I've got two programs. I've got Winterreise and I've got uh, a program with uh, other stuff. And I, I'm not sure which one I'm doing. <laughs> but maybe it's the Winterreise, if you say so. Yes, OK, sir, in the middle toward the back there. Yeah. It, um, I just started reading your book and, and uh, in the, uh, the discussion of the first song, Gute Nacht, uh, do you point out the importance of the word fremd? And, and, the, and then you discuss another Schubert song uh, where he uses fremdling and the possible interpretations of, of that word. <coughs> and uh, usually whenever I see an English translation, it's almost always strange, a stranger. Mm -hmm. A stranger I came, a stranger I left. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes foreign. Yeah. And uh, but I'm wondering, in the context of these songs, uh, wouldn't a more appropriate English uh, word be outsider? Because it's a stranger and a foreigner, these these are uh, these are status that's that's conferred by happenstance. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, an outsider is someone who chooses to be outside of the the group or the community. And yeah, I, and I wonder if that's what we're talking about here. I think that is one of the things we're talking about. I mean, the wonderful thing about the word fremd is that it has all these uh, connotations and layers. Uh, and I suppose if we were, if we use the word outsider in our translation, then we're already pushing it in one particular direction. And but that's always the case with the translation of, of poetry. And uh, I do think the word fremd has this complexity, which is is very useful. I mean. Partly, it means that he's—he's he's, it means all sorts of things. It means he's come into, the, he came as a, as a non-member of the family, and he left as a non-member of the family. So he didn't get—he didn't get married to her. He is—it uh, it points to all sorts of things. I, the use of the word foreigners use is, is 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 good because there are so many political hints uh, throughout the piece of of Müller's and consequently by extension Schubert's disaffection with the state of uh, government in, in the German lands in the 1820s. And to be, Fremd is foreign. Everybody felt, a German felt a foreigner in their own country because they didn't really feel that they had a country to live in. That was a German country. It was early nationalism in the 1820s. Mm. Was there a question from a lady in front? So just a couple of rows in front? No? Yeah, there's one from a lady next to... Uh, yeah, th th just the back, bus down that road, that down that road, yep. When was it first performed in public, and how was it perceived, and how did it compare to what had gone before it in terms of Lida? Um, it was first performed, uh, I don't know, we don't really know whether it was the first 12 songs or the first 24. It was first performed, recorded by Schubert, just after he'd written it, to a group of friends, uh, and their immediate response was that they didn't like it. Uh, they, they, they really didn't like it as much as his other songs, and he said, well, actually, in the end, you will like this more than any of my other songs. Um, and the only one, his, his, his rather naughty friend, Schober, said he liked Der Lindenbaum, the one we heard earlier. Um, but it wasn't performed... Uh, it was performed pr it privately, I think, in the 1830s by um, uh, Schubert's great supporter, Johann Michael Vogel, a much older man than Schubert, who, who was a sort of retired opera singer who did a lot, sang a lot of Schubert songs. Uh, we don't know much about that. It then it wasn't performed in concert, as a concert piece, uh, in public until the, I think, till the mid to late 1850s. Um, and so uh, what's not clear is what Schubert wrote it for. And that's true of a lot of the leader repertoire, the early leader repertoire anyway. 
because it, it was it was being written uh, to be published and to be sold to people in Vienna and beyond, and it was probably being written for them to play at home, for them to sit at their piano and play it to themselves, for them to accompany their girlfriend or boyfriend or perform to a handful of friends. So it's not clear that it was intended as a concert work at all. May occasionally these cycles were broken up and even in the case of a cycle like Dichterliebe, the Schumann song cycle, which seems so much a unity, can't imagine nowadays somebody taking a song out of Dichterliebe and singing it in a concert. Nevertheless, Clara Schumann, Schumann's wife after his death put on concerts where she would do a couple of songs from Dichterliebe. So it didn't have that, there wasn't a perception of its aesthetic unity in public and it wasn't necessarily a concert piece. I don't think that means Schubert didn't consider it to be a um, aesthetic unity and I don't think it, e it means that he didn't consider its dramatic structure. But um, it's a weird trajectory to think of it moving from being sung in this tiny little room with Schubert sitting at the piano to being, you know, played in Carnegie Hall or uh, wherever. Mm -hmm. There's a lady a couple of rows forward. Yes, you in the middle. Speaking of leaving audiences rung out, I think you rung us out at your Curlew River performance at the Synod House in New York. And I wondered about your relationship with Britain, which is off the topic, but just the way you sing his music. Um, I'm very, I mean, I feel so lucky to have that music to sing, to have so much that was written for um, a not heavy uh, tenor voice, uh, such a lot in uh, English, such a lot of amazing poetry, also not in English, in, 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 in French and in German and in it Italian. Um, and also, uh, it's, uh, I feel lucky that Peter Pierce, who worked with Benjamin, Br Benjamin Britten, opened up such a lot of repertoire for English singers. So. If English singers are, as it were, and, and American singers, allowed to sing uh, a German song repertoire, if, they're, if they are credible figures in that, as it, if they are credible evangelists in the, in the Bach Passions, it, a lot of that is down to the path-breaking work of, of Peter Pears, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Yes, lady over here. Hello, I like um, you were singing of... Uh, Britain's song too, but what I wanted to say is my favorite song in Winter Eyes is the Dream of Spring. I'm sorry, I don't know the German, so I can't say it, but that is the only very happy beginning, although it's just an illusion, it's not the real spring, but he's thinking of spring. But that makes me happy, and it's, it's, it's my favorite song. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way, too, when you're singing? Does it make you happy a little bit? <laughs> and then is there any other song that you love to sing and makes you happy uh, in the cycle? No, well, I wouldn't say that's what the cycles... I mean, the cycles, for me, it's, I mean, I suppose it's, it's cathartic or it's, it helps you to process things or it... Uh, it's 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 enjoyable to sing, I suppose, because it's a great work of musical art. But I wouldn't say um, that I uh, sing it and feel it's a joyous experience in that way. And I, I do think the beginning of Fruiting's Traum is very. Uh, I think one's aware of the fact that it's a false false dream, and I do think this use of the major key in in Winterizer is completely um, completely heartbreaking. There was a question. I mean, Schubert said something. He said, um, I think it's in a letter, when, whenever I try to sing of uh, joy, it turns to pain, and whenever I try to sing of pain, it turns to joy. And for him, these two things were very close and very overlapping, and I think that's a human experience. I mean, it's, Schubert didn't have children, but I think uh, p children, children present to one, that sort of close connection between incredible anxiety and pain and incredible joy, and that the joy that contains a sort of pain and anxiety. Um, it's a bit different from Winterizer, but. <laughs> I'm just going back to Britain. I wanted to say one more thing, which is that also it's wonderful that 
I mean, Britain is the composer who continues to write in this tradition. I, not, you know, after the after 1945, not hardly any very good composers composed um, piano accompanied song, and uh, Britain has composed masterpieces of piano accompanied song. And precisely, I think, because he was such a wonderful interpreter of this tradition. Okay, we have a question in the middle there. Yeah. Uh. Forgive me, I don't have the benefit yet of your book. Uh, but if one looks at the uh, poetic and dramatic uh, arc of the, the cycle, uh, it seems to me that Lindenbaum has a different character, somewhat different character than the rest of the cycle. Uh, the beginning of Spring Dream, of course, also has that. But I was wondering, do you, what particular role within the cycle as a whole do you find uh, Lindenbaum as a perhaps different experience than the other uh, songs? Um, gosh. I think it's about... It is a lyrical moment, and there aren't. It comes between two. It comes between a sort of scurrying, urgent moment and a, key, a keening moment, and those sorts of lyrical moments are rare in the cycle. And I think in in Lindenbaum, it's not meant. It's not ironic exactly. Certainly not ironic at the beginning, unlike I think the beginning of Friedensstrom. I think it becomes certainly has the capacity to become ironic by the last verse where you have this endlessly repeated dum bum 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 ba dum bum 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 which is then taken up into the next song um, so I think it's a, a lyrical moment and I, th I think it's about I, I didn't go on to read the rest of uh, the, the bit of the chapter I wanted to read because I realize it actually takes much longer to read something out than one realizes um, but Thomas Mann saw Lindenbaum as being about death and that the tree is the tree is as it were calling him back to lie down on the snow and go to sleep and never wake up and that's I'm sure that's there in the poem but I think there's an also there's also a much more obvious uh, level in which it's about the, the the false call of memory and how one has to move on and leave the past behind so that when the tree rustles and says here you will find peace what it's saying is come back and live in the past and and and, and the, the, the wanderer won't allow himself to do that which is a positive thing I suppose we have time for one more question yes sir in the toward the back there um, how much do you think that Schubert identified personally with the protagonist of the cycle and could you talk about some of the ways that you think he did or didn't I think there are all sorts of coincidences which would have allowed identification which would have drawn him towards the cycle um, uh, I talk about in the book about um, this man in a house why is, at the very beginning in Gute Nacht he's in he's in a leaving a house in the dead of night why has he been staying in this house and I present a lot of sort of evidence that one might think he was a private tutor in the house. That was, that was such a big experience for, for German intellectuals in the late 18th, early 19th century, people like Hölderlin, uh, the Schlegels, um, and Schubert himself um, fell in love with um, uh, his pupil in the Esterhazy household and uh, obviously didn't get anywhere doing that. So. Uh, Th there's that coincidence. There's th I think the last song, is, as I was saying earlier, is something that would have appealed to him. The idea of, of a beggar musician was actually, you know, really cut out for him to set to music with these fears he may have had. And I think there's also a little um, his his nickname, Nick, Schubert's nickname in his circle of friends was Canavas because he always, if somebody came into the Schubert circle. He, a new person, he'd always ask the question, can er vast? Does he know how to do something? So, you know, what can he do for us? Can he, can he dance? Can he play the cello? Can he always want to know? <laughs> and in, in the, um, one of the key bits of the poem is vas, uh, he does vas er can in Maimon. And I think Schubert would have, that would have echoed in Schubert's mm. head. Um, 
I'm sure there are lots of others, but those are the two that particularly strike me at the moment. But I think biographical connection is quite important and sort of slight, sometimes uh, spurned as if it was slightly unrespectable. That there are, I think artists like Schubert are dr often drawn to things by things in their life, that they want to express something about their life, but at the same time, there's a tussle between that and the formal qualities of the music, and that's the creative process, really. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, your creative process here has produced a masterpiece, and I uh, heart heartily recommend this uh, as a book that's uh, firmly accessible to musicians, to lay people, to academics, and uh, everybody, and it, uh, as I say, touches on a dazzling array of topics. Uh, so congratulations, and it's been a real pleasure having you here in Bostridge this evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.